Nikola Tesla once said, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Physically speaking, energy is the ability to do work. Since economies do work, you'd figure that economics would be very concerned with energy. And you'd be wrong, at least for mainstream economics. The same is not true, however, for ecological economics. In this short lecture, I'll introduce you to two important concepts in energy analysis, namely exergy and eroi, and discuss what they imply for the future of economic growth. If we compare GDP and energy use across countries, we quickly see that there's a very strong correlation between the two. However, correlation does not imply causation, so it's worth digging a little deeper. The neoclassical theory of economic growth, for which Robert Solow won the Nobel Prize, postulates that economic output Y, over time, is a function of capital K and labor L. However, economic growth cannot be explained if you only consider these two factors. An additional factor, A, is needed to make the equation work and account for the unexplained part of growth. It's worth emphasizing that A is not a measured quantity. It's the residual that is not explained by K or L. And this residual is called the total factor productivity. It's often considered to be a proxy for technological progress, and it can account for up to 60% of the economic growth in the equation. That's quite a lot to leave to a residual factor. And you'll note that nothing related to the environment appears anywhere in this equation. No materials, land, or energy, which is typical of neoclassical economics. However, the ecological economists, Bob Ayers and Benjamin War, have shown that the residual can be explained by including a particular measure of energy known as useful work. At this point, I need to introduce two important concepts from thermodynamics, exergy and useful work. If you haven't already watched my lecture on what the laws of thermodynamics have to do with the economy, now might be a good time to do so. Exergy is a measure of potential work. It's the part of energy which is in principle available to do useful work. And when people speak of energy consumption, it is really exergy that is consumed. Exergy can be used up or destroyed in a given process, Energy, however, is always conserved. It can't be destroyed. A container of petrol and a swimming pool full of water at room temperature might have the same amount of total energy, but the petrol has a lot more exergy than the swimming pool. The petrol can be used to power a car, but the water in the pool can't really be used to do any useful work. Useful work is what enables services in the economy. And useful is defined in a physical engineering sense, not in a this is good or bad for society sense. There are different types of useful work, like muscle work, mechanical work, and heat delivered to the point of final use. In any conversion process, some of the exergy input actually delivers useful work, and some is lost as waste heat. And it's important to note that there is a difference between waste heat, which is a loss, and heat that is delivered to the point of final use. Energy and exergy go through different stages before they are used, and an example probably helps to illustrate this. Let's say we have a coal-fired power station, which is providing electricity that I'm using to power a fan in my office. Primary exergy, or just exergy, is the potential work that could be done with the energy stored in the coal. Final energy is the electricity produced by the turbine in the power plant, and quite a lot of the primary exergy does not turn the turbine and is lost as waste heat. Useful work is the movement of the fan blades themselves, which are powered by an electric motor. And lastly, the fan delivers an energy service, i.e. the movement of air in my office. An important quantity here is the ratio of useful work, which is an output, over the primary exergy, which is an input. This ratio is called the exergy efficiency, or conversion efficiency. So why is this important? Well, for starters, by including useful work in a production function alongside capital and labor, errors in war are able to explain US GDP growth very accurately, without needing a mysterious technological residual. 
And this really shows the importance of energy as a driver of economic growth. Despite being published in reputable energy and ecological economics journals, this finding has largely been ignored by the mainstream economics community. How does exergy actually power economic growth? According to Ayers and War, through the exergy growth cycle. It starts when new technologies allow for the more efficient conversion of exergy to useful work. Because of this, the cost of useful work declines. And as costs fall, so do prices. Declining prices generate increased demand for goods and services. And the value of the additional output is paid back to labor through higher salaries and to capital through higher profits. The increased cost of labor then incentivizes the substitution of energy for labor. And this drives further improvements in the exergy efficiency, and we're back to where we started. Paul Brockway, who is one of my colleagues at the University of Leeds, has done some interesting research that suggests the exergy growth cycle may be weakening as it becomes more difficult to improve the conversion efficiency. You can see in this graph that exergy efficiency in the US has remained pretty flat for a long time, and exergy efficiency in the UK may now be plateauing. These findings suggest that we may be approaching physical limits for some conversion processes, or people may be switching to less energy efficient processes, such as air conditioning. And these findings are really important. If the conversion efficiency stops increasing, in other words, if we can't extract more useful work out of a given amount of exergy, then the only way to grow the economy, based on the work of heirs and war, is to use more exergy. So that's exergy and useful work. Now for something slightly different, EROI, EROI, Energy Return on Energy Invested. And this is another way of thinking about energy as an input to the economy, which was pioneered by Charlie Hall and his colleagues. As an aside, Charlie Hall once told a friend of mine, in life, you can really only do three things well. For me, that's been my work, my marriage, and fly fishing. That's why we never had children. EROI is defined as the ratio of energy returned to society over energy required to get that energy. And it's a very good way of comparing different energy technologies. Let's say you have an oil well. It produces barrels of oil which have a certain energy content. However, it also took energy to build the oil well and it takes energy to maintain and operate it. If the energy that the well provides is greater than the energy required to build and operate it, then it's a net energy winner. Its EROI is greater than one. However, if it takes you more energy to build and operate the well than the barrels of oil that you get out of it, then the EROI is less than one, and it's probably not worth doing, at least not from a biophysical point of view. EROI can be measured at different points in the energy conversion chain, and the example I just gave you describes EROI at the point of extraction, because it looks at the crude oil coming out of the well and the energy to build that well. You could also look at the energy in a liter of refined petrol and the energy it takes to build the oil well, produce the crude oil, refine it into petrol, and transport it to the petrol station. That would describe the EROI at the point of use. And EROI at the point of use is always lower than at the point of extraction because energy is lost in the conversion process and it takes extra energy to get the fuel to the point of use. The EROI of oil has been declining over time as the easiest to extract reserves have been depleted. It takes a lot more energy to find and extract new sources of oil now than it did in the 1930s when you could basically just dig a hole in the ground and watch the oil come gushing out. One of the big debates in the EROI literature is whether the EROI of renewables is lower or higher than fossil fuels. In the early literature, it was often claimed that the EROI of renewables was lower, but this may have been due to a different system boundaries being used between studies. In general, renewables are used to produce electricity, while fossil fuels are burned as thermal fuels. These data show EROI at the point of use for a variety of different energy sources. 
And you can see that how the fuel is used is very important. For example, if coal is used as a thermal fuel, i.e. to produce heat, then it has a much higher EROI than if it's used to produce electricity. These data, which were compiled by my colleague Alyosha Slamershak, suggest that the EROI of renewables is higher than fossil fuels if the energy sources are used to produce electricity. However, EROI doesn't tell us everything about how useful a given energy source is. For example, energy stored in coal can be used at any time, while the electricity from wind is intermittent. It's vitally important that we understand how EROI is changing over time because a decline in EROI could have disastrous effects for the economy and society. Back in the 1970s, the economy was being powered by fossil fuels with a relatively high EROI. While some of the energy produced was needed to build and operate the energy system, the majority of the energy went to society. This meant that there was a large economic surplus that could be spent on discretionary consumption and investment. However, if in the future the energy system relies on harder to extract fossil fuels, more of the energy produced will be needed just to maintain the energy system. More investment in energy acquisition means less discretionary consumption and less discretionary investment. As EROI falls, so does the energy available to society. And the energy does not fall linearly. As EROI approaches 1, the energy remaining to society decreases dramatically. An EROI ratio of 10 to 1 means 90% of the energy obtained is available to society. At 5 to 1, it's 80%, and at 3 to 1, it's only 67%. For this reason, the relationship between EROI and the remaining energy is called the net energy cliff. Research done by my colleagues Paul Brockway, Lena Brand Correa, Anne Owen, and Lucas Hart shows that the EROI of fossil fuels is perched dangerously close to the edge of this cliff. The EROI for fossil fuels at point of use is only 6 to 1 and declining. This makes it all the more important to move towards a renewable energy system before it is too late.